for what that bill had anything to do with this, and it didn't have anything to do with it. Basically, what that did is, in the 30s, the, something called Glass-Steagall forced the separation between commercial banking, you know, like Wells Fargo, and investment banking, like Goldman Sachs until a couple of months ago. And they said, those two things can't be housed in the same institution. They have to be separated. And there were famous uh, financial services firms, that what, we not, what, what are called universal banks, that did both commercial banking and did investment banking. Um, J.P. Morgan was an example. Citibank was an example. There were many. They were separate. From the middle 30s, 1930s, until 1999, that separation was in place. Now, there was a lot of financial innovation, and there was a lot of... Uh, smart lawyers finding ways around these prohibitions so that by the 1990s a lot of these activities were being done by uh, in different ways but but the investment banks and the commercial banks were doing more and more of the same thing but it wasn't legalized or legitimized and there were particular little pockets where it couldn't happen it was difficult to get around and everybody just wanted to have a le level playing field said we can all do the same things gross oversimplification. But the critical moment came, there was one thing a bank definitely could not do, a Wells Fargo. It could not underwrite insurance. It could, depending on the state it was located in and the form of its charter, sell some kinds of insurance, but it couldn't underwrite. Citibank had been opposed to the bill because Citibank's attitude was, we can always figure out a way to do anything we want. Why should we make it easier for our competitors to compete with us? We always have a leg up because we always, we find a lawyer who finds a little uh, loophole and then we drive a truck through the loophole and that's our forte. So, you know, we, Citibank just blocked us until it wanted to merge with Travelers, which was an insurance company, and then they switched and the only really big thing the bill did was allow Citibank to merge with Travelers. Uh, mostly it regularized um, what was really already in the in industry practice. Any number of, of investment banks that were the product of the 1930s regulation decided to remain investment banks, standalone investment banks and not take advantage of this new structure. And the big names were Goldman Sachs, uh, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers. Does, does that mean anything to you? You get those names? Okay. <laughs> they were the standalone investment banks. They have all disappeared in one way or another in a matter uh, since this summer, in, in just a few months. And as you know, uh, Bear Stearns basically, it, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve arranged a shotgun wedding between Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan Chase. Lehman was allowed to fail. Merrill Lynch uh, was, had to merge with Bank of America to stay afloat. And Goldman Sachs and uh, Morgan Stanley applied for a charter to be a bank holding company. That is, in essence, taking advantage of what the 1999 Act permitted. So my, I would say arguably there was an indirect effect of the 1999 Act signed under Bill Clinton. And that was to have created a structure that saved three of these standalone investment banks that were arguably in danger of going the same way that Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns had done. But, but in terms of doing anything to facilitate the financial hanky-panky that was going on, it had nothing to do with it. Now. Uh, I have a chart here. I wasn't able to get out big enough, but there's these little inside of all the financial institutions. There are an outside of all the regulatory agencies, and there are arrows going from which regulatory agency controls which financial services agents, uh, yeah, institution. And most of them have at least two arrows, at least two regulators down, reaching down their neck. The only one that was comparatively speaking lightly regulated was the standalone investment banks. They were regulated by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And as I said, they all disappeared. And you make out of that what you want. Okay, but that, 
Now, what was going on then? Okay, if there was no overt um, deregulation, what was it, what's been going on? And, and it's and it's longer than the eight years of the Bush administration. Uh, it, it 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 goes. It, I think it goes back to the uh, to the Clinton administration, if not longer. And what I say is that regulation failed, but not for the want of its quantity. What what has occurred in financial services has also occurred in in many other regulated industries, and it's the following. It's called regulatory capture. And this is, uh, comes from what's known as public choice theory, which is sort of transcends economics and political science. It, it's a combination of economics and political science. And you'll find public choice people in both those departments at various universities around the country. And what regulatory capture says is that an industry that's been regulated, certainly one that's been regulated for a long period of time, you will tend to have the regulatory agency and the industry come to see the world in similar ways and from similar viewpoints and see each other as mutually interdependent. And the, there are a number of forces at work that cause that. The first is that if you are a regulatory agency and you over-regulate your industry, you make your industry unprofitable and it begins to disappear, your job disappears. You don't have an industry to regulate anymore. So there is a sense uh, within a regulatory agency of, uh, yes, maybe there's some conduct that we have to make sure there's not so much of it that the public, there's a public backlash, but we also have to protect our industry. Um, the second factor, which is very important, that works for regulatory capture goes back to this mishmash of, re of, of committees in Congress that that have oversight authority uh, over industries like uh, Senate banking and now it's unified in House Financial Services Committee. Uh, those committees, the members of those committees, their primary source of donations come within the industry over which they have oversight. So that a House Financial Services Committee, their members, the largest portion of their contributions, political contributions, come from the financial services industry. So they have the interests of the industry in, in, in their hearts. Uh, and if the, age, the regulatory agency, let's say um, the Office of the Control of the Currency or the Federal Reserve, two of the agencies that regulate banks, commercial banks, if they are mistreating their commercial banks, the chairman or his chief of staff calls up the contact at the regulatory agent says, would you please come down and explain why you're beating up uh, our bankers? Uh, the most famous instance of this, because it was so overt, it was so over the top, it was maybe bordering on criminal, was, do you remember the Keating Five? Because of course this came up in this election again. There were five senators who went to the regulator of a savings and loan association, headed up by a man by the name of Keating, who had built an empire, um, uh, and he was based in a lot. He was based in Arizona and, and California, and, and at various operations in other parts of the country. And he got these five senators to go in and, to meet with a, a regulator who they had oversight over, uh, whose you know existence and well-being and and appropriations depend, depended on these five senators, and pressure him to back off from his regulatory enforcement against the savings and loan. And one of those senators was, of course, John McCain, the only one of the five whose political career survived this. Eventually, all the other four uh, uh, were driven out of politics. Uh, so that, that's how Washington works. Now, the third force that tends to work in favor of regula cause regulatory capture is, the, is, is a set of incentives um, that operate on the individual rank and file people who work in a regulatory agency. And this uh, recently came up in the aviation industry where it was alleged that the FAA, which oversees safety regulations, was lax 
in its regulation, particularly American airlines and of 